we want this to be an interactive session. We're going to uh, we're going to have a discussion here. There's not going to be any PowerPoint. We're just going to talk about the state of production and how it works. And and Massimo is going to focus on what Massimo and Brady both are going to focus on what has been an evolution for Technicolor. Um, you know, Technicolor is a big name in film and television. It's, they, 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 they are a his, historic member of the industry. And they have for a very long time been on the leading edge of all of this. Um, the interesting thing that I know about Technicolor is, is not just the feature film things and everything, but they were, have always been at the forefront of the digital revolution. And, and this is where companies like Technicolor and Teradek bond over um, a shared need. And, and we're lucky enough to be able to have some people in here who are involved in some of the process, Massimo Davalio and Brady Woods. And, and, and we're gonna just have a talk about all of this. And, and you know, it's like, and, and we kind of start off with something simple. How has the pandemic changed the way Technicolor Post has worked? And, and how much has that changed your operating systems and how you have moved forward for the last year since we've all been pretty much COVID tainted for a year now? Boss, yeah, speak thank a little you. bit about the global organization. Yeah, yeah, and thank you, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Gary, for 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 having us. Uh, well, I, I, what, before we start, please introduce yourselves because yeah, I yeah, forgot to do that. <laughs> and I am uh, Massimo Devolio. I'm the COO of uh, Technicolor Post Production uh, on a worldwide basis. Uh, I spent a, a lot of my career, uh, the last almost the last twenty years, at Technicolor. Uh, and I have to say uh, that journey has been totally incredible for us. And, and you know, the, the last 12 months, last 14, 14 months, I would say, have been kind of a game changer. And I think what we want to do today, I think with Brady, is kind of take you through through our journey as well. Uh, the, you know, the last 12 months, it's just, you know, I've, our business has just been transformed, essentially. Uh, we have to think differently. I think we're, we're at Technicolor, we were lucky enough is, we had some ideas, you know, like, you know, a year ago, two years ago, we had some ideas of where the business was going. Uh, you know, we had a, you know, very strong uh, software development team that's working very closely with our artists. So actually when, when COVID happened, uh, we had a few things on the shelves that uh, we, we, we thought at the time will take years to, you know, to start uh, uh, selling and, 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 and preaching and pitching to our clients. And actually, in about a matter of few weeks, we had to lift and shift our business. We literally have to lift and shift. I remember it was a Friday afternoon when essentially, you know, especially in LA and in, in Hollywood, we had to make a decision to leave our brick and mortar facility behind us and actually move our whole infrastructure at home, not only at home for our clients, but at home for our talents and our artists. And we had to move as well all our infrastructure either in the cloud or actually somewhere where we can actually access remotely and that has been uh, it's been a tremendous experience a brutal uh, but a kind of amazing kind of a, the way i see it it's a once 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 in a lifetime opportunity to do to actually shift your business out of the blue from uh it was like this in in friday totally different on monday and we did that we accomplished that relatively quickly we were up and running you know within days and, and that is mainly because the safety net that we have at Technicolor was technology. Yeah. And we had a view, we had a vision where we wanted to go and, and COVID just accelerated that, 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 that vision. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, so I am Brady Woods. I am our VP of production services. I oversee our strategy around workflows, technology and new business development, particularly with a focus on streaming services as we see them sort of as the indicating of change in our industry. Uh, and so focused on really working cross-functionally across our teams from dailies through picture post-production, sound post-production, all the way through uh, the marketing teams, localization and delivery uh, on a global basis. Uh, and yeah, I think for, for our organization, the lift and shift home, as Massimo said, was uh, some of the very most difficult days of our organization, but also some of the proudest in terms of our ability to reach in and support each other as a team. 
Uh, we were able to test workflows on a global basis in each location, share the information back, and as a result, we're able to get up and running in a very short amount of time and able to make all of our artists available to work remotely where the work dictated, which I think was a real key success moment. And, and, and that's a real interesting point in this because I don't think people understand the security levels that you work on with the clients that you have. I, I mean, you work on levels of security that, that you know, rival the Defense Department and then are better than some in, in a lot of instances and moving that entire infrastructure with all of the security aspects and the VPNs and everything else was a fundamental change in everything you had to do because of because of just nothing more than the layers and layers and layers of protocol and the security that you had to deal with just to protect your clients. Absolutely. absolutely. It, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the first few weeks, you know, some of the, uh, uh, sometime you got a, and aspects of legal and security that I had to uh, that had to be embraced. And one of the things that most of uh, most of our team were trying to reach was we had to finalize kind of a documentation about our security protocols around how we work remotely, get that sign up by our internal security team, and present it to all our studio in order to actually do the work, perform the work, and carry on. And that was a race, you know, against time in order to to hit the you know delivery dates of our clients. Were, were, uh, were the lawyers still using faxes? No. Yeah. <laughs> They, I, I ran think, into that this year. I, but the lawyers were still using fax machines. Everybody else was doing electronic certification and the lawyers still wanted faxes. It was DocuSign. Yeah. DocuSign. Suddenly, I'm sure the lawyers have done their full revolution as well during COVID, for sure, for sure. For sure. I think the other key component to complexity to that is that when you think of Technicolor, Gary, you think of the global brand, right? So right. it's not just one location in one silo. We actually have to, our value proposition to our content creators and our artists is it's a like service. So where it's secure in Los Angeles, it must also be secure in Vancouver and how we secure it has to be the same. Right. Uh, and so it's getting our teams, which I feel we were in a really unique position that we have as a mission over the last five years, really been focused on acting uh, globally and locally. So aligning globally, acting locally. And I think, you know, Sherry and Massimo together have really made us prepared for Sherry, our president of Worldwide Post and Massimo have really prepared us for the challenge to cross collaborate by, by location. When I joined Technicolor 11 years ago, this is not something we did. You know, we worked uh, in each location very separately. Uh, we were not necessarily always collaborating on workflow color science. We were not always collaborating on how we managed our data. Uh, and this situation, you know, we we were fortunate enough that we have built our backbone. We are working together as a team. You know, Massimo leads conversations with our technology teams in every location on a weekly basis. We are aligned in how we approach it. Thus, when we had to then test it, we were able to actually execute three different ways to test how we wanted to work from home in three different locations, come back together, compare notes, and ultimately get everybody certified by our clients at the same well, time. And that's, and that's a real interesting point, Brady, because at the point you started was literally the dawn of the digital revolution 11 that's years right. ago. I, I mean, it, it, you know, it's only 10 years ago we did Fukushima, so that fundamentally that's changed right. everything. So people don't realize that this industry has grown incredibly quickly as part of it. What are some of the things that you're really proud of, Massimo, and how you enabled Technicolor to take over and, and achieve some of the things you're doing? And, and if you can, mention some of the clients that we're talking about in, in, in an overall level, not the actual projects, but so people understand who you're working with. First, uh, where, where I'm very proud is, 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 is the team, is the Technicolor team. I, I think there was an incredible uh, 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 amount of hard work and, and, and really hard work. We, we, we work day and night, you know, the first few few weeks, long, long weeks of, of a pandemic in order to continue to serve our client and the team has been instrumental. And the team, so the, the technology team, the software development team, but also our artists, you had people who were so focused on the artist side in our team, that's where I'm very proud to actually, we have to continue to work. Very, there was that very emotional decision where people will do anything test any kind of solution to continue to work and that was kind of incredible it kind of bring you back to to to, to the, the essential of what it's it's about artists it's it's a, you know this business we produce content it's kind of very unique uh in in, in the world you know we're we're not producing and nothing against you know producing cars or whatsoever but there was like uh, that, that creative essential need to a hey, we got to carry on and we got to keep doing it we could keep doing our art so that, that's where I'm very proud of, of a team. Where also I think I had amazing partners as, as, as the partner, as my vendors, you know, Teradek was one of them. 
uh, I think we they they we all understood. We you know it was not about a pay me get me a PO or whatsoever. It was really like get me the equipment. I got to keep on going. Don't worry, we're going to take care of the rest and the detail. It was really about partnership for me with with, with my vendors and a few others as well. You know I, I think you know Ivor has to be with Tradici, Tradec, and a few others like that. They have been instrumental, and we understood how it was critical to continue to support us during 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 these these tough times. Um, you keep talking about the talent at at Technicolor, and a couple of people. I have had a couple of notes about how do you, who do you consider the talent? I, I mean, I, I'm assuming it's editors and colorists and and the people who make you know the graphic artists and the people who do all of this. And and there's been a couple of questions, one privately and one publicly, about how, what does Technicolor consider talent, uh, or in, who in, or who does my Technicolor? perspective, my my definition is everyone that that that, that works there. In yes. full transparency. It's very much uh, everyone. And look, my technology team has my have been amazing. They've really been amazing to 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 lift and shift. And and yeah. that's the other thing too, is that people who don't think the technology is art has an has its own art form. Um you Absolutely. know, I mean, I think you. that's the value proposition, right? I think for us, when we think of artists, yes, we include our technology team in that that talent pool, right? So we think of colorists, online editors, visual effects artists, mixers, re-recording mixers, Foley artists, um, you know, everything that runs the gamut of the of dailies colorists, dailies operators, dits, uh, those process of dailies all the way through delivery, we have artists that are providing those services. But we also have technologists that are providing technology solutions that are also providing mm -hmm. similar services. And really what we we believe as it relates to technology is that we are for artists by artists, right? So we are artists first. Anything that we release to market uh, goes through the rigorous testing of our artistic team uh, ahead of ever seeing its hands into the content creators themselves. Because what we want is to know that the solutions we put out in the world are the way our artists want their content to be reviewed. Uh, and and that, that process, I think, has only been more true in the pandemic where we've used solutions like TechStream, our remote collaboration tool with our artists, to be able to bring our artist collaboration in room to in home. Uh, but that also has to go through a number of tests that allow us to say, our colorist wants you to see their work through this medium. And this medium is acceptable for them for you to make choices. Um, so what kind of obstacles did you run into for all of this? I mean, you know, I, I have I have a few hundred in my head. Yeah. <laughs> internet, <laughs> done this the like internet. You have. <laughs> see, that's the thing is, is that 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 there is so much that you don't think about as an artist, yeah. real-time playback, yeah. uh, highest compression level, um, you yeah. know, simple things for a colorist. Are you delivering a 10-bit signal that it can be read the same way on the receiving monitor and the front end monitor? There's a huge right. amount of, of issues to run into. What, what has been, I, I think, uh, the part that uh, varies with tangible aspects, connectivity, internet, security, varies also the intangible, the intangible of being in a room with a colorist or a mixer. Yeah. And I think where we we made we we made a the decision to develop our own tool to some extent because we wanted to recreate develop our own tool with, with our artists because we wanted to recreate that aspects of collaboration as close as we can of being in the same room. Mm -hmm. That's really hard. There is that you know there, and and, and this is this is where um, uh, you know simple things like you know when you have an interface and and, and you have a, a live sessions and someone are they're on their iPhone or iPad or Apple TV at home and, and making sure that the user interface kind of recreate that reality of being the same room with one of our artists and, and uh -huh. little things like that where uh, our artists were, you know, will, will actually have an opinion about, no, no, I want to remove any buttons on, on the screen. I want to make it very as sleek as, we, as, as you can. Obviously, color science is in our DNA, so we made and we ensure that you know color uh, mm -hmm. was was you know on, on, was a main pillar of, of of the solutions and some other solutions. I think this is where, for us, one of the and even up, up, I mean until today, like you know we're looking at solution, you know HDR solution, you know 4K, 8K, etc. The, the it's it's about making the the collaboration as real as you can and being at home and that that that's a tough part uh after that the other it was actually very hard i go back to 14 months ago it's funny i went back to my office a month ago i haven't been there for a year and what was amazing for me was what i had on my whiteboard <laughs> and what what was on my whiteboard in my office 
was something that I can tell you will have taken me like most probably two years to accomplish. Yeah. And the challenge at the time was, uh, really has a great expression about that. It was how are we going to convince our client to change? Because, you know, it's an industry where we are used yeah. to of a certain way of working. Yeah. And, and the change management is totally different post pandemic, right? So we say oh. that, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. COVID is the mother of adoption. It, yeah. We are seeing a holistic change in the way people are approaching the puzzle at hand. We are seeing an openness to more information is available. More context is available. Learning is available. Uh, and that has opened the door to a vision that Technicolor's post-production team with their software development group has had for for such a long time. Uh, you know, we we have struggled to see adoption of new technologies, but that is gone now. We've erased uh, the holdbacks of the fear because we were stuck doing it. Everyone had to do it. And I sat on phone calls teaching DPs how to, you know, utilize their iPads functions ahead of how to get on Teams, how to get on Zoom. Uh, we've had to, to, to create the ability to make our amazing craft artists able to embrace parts of technology that had not been part of their definition of their job and be able to do so in a way that they felt embraced by the community with, right? Which is we are trying to recreate that experience. And, and that brings up a different point. That's the kind of, of customer service technology that had been lost and oh. and and that's part of all of this and you know being one of those people who's who who's lived on the front of technology and then all of a sudden had technology catch up to what I'm doing has been kind of interesting for for people like us to do this and and it's it's always been incumbent on us to try and edge people forward as the technology kind of goes. And now we're in a situation where uh, I, I love to show it. I have a, a, a funny little gif of, of um, you know, Wallace and Gromit. Wallace is building the rack of his you know, sled as he's going forward. And I use it for virtual production a lot, but I've used it for remote production too, because we're literally building the highway as we go. And, right. and, 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 and this is a fundamental change for all of us. I don't think a lot of people, everybody's like, oh, we're going to go back to normal. It's like, I don't think normal is the same thing anymore. I mean, I don't see audio people ever needing to be go back into a suite except for final finish, you know, Foley people in that. I, I don't see those kinds of jobs progressing back to the point where they're in the facilities the way they were. But, but there's so many things that can be done. And, and the other thing about this is that it has globally expanded our workforce. Now we can get talent from places that we couldn't get before, people that didn't, you didn't have access to because of distance or time zones, that now we're working in a way that we've never had before. What are some of the things that you think have changed for the future in all of this? I hope you're right, Gary. I think for me, as it relates to global talent, to me, this is fundamental to where we have to go. If we want to talk about diversity and inclusion, we have to talk about a global workforce. If we want yes. to talk about building opportunities for more diverse voices in the process, we have to talk about shaking off our comfort of saying, I'm only going to work with a Los Angeles based artist because I'm in Los Angeles. Why? We can recreate that home experience and you can work from, from places and people who are di from different cultures and backgrounds. And so for me, that's a very exciting change that I hope continues forward, that we're going to see an adoption of working with people in different parts of the world. I also think it'll teach content creators to be able to be smarter in terms of their tax credit of capabilities because they, they spend a lot of time trying to change manage doing post-production for LA-based productions in parts of Canada or in parts of London. Who knows where everybody is? We're all at home. So what's it the It doesn't difference? matter now. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't matter now. So yeah. Totally. No, no, I agree with what Brady was saying. I mean, for me, uh, yeah, again, the way we were looking at the world two years ago, the way we look at it today, you know, if someone asked me today, uh, hey, you know, would you be interested to invest in Southeast Asia or in Europe or somewhere in, 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 in the US or in, even in Canada? You know, two years ago, three years ago, I, I would have thought like very brick and mortar, there were going to be a lot of investment. Today, it's like, no, no, no worries. I can like spin up, you know, uh, you know, a, a group of creatives out of uh, out of anywhere in the world relatively easily, you know, either through the cloud or either through just, you know, very the, some of the solution we have today. Then if I have a DP who traditionally, you know, we had to wait weeks or we'll, we'll put some some shows on hold in order to review and approve and come into into a facility, Today, I'm just going to tell him, hey, just, you know, switch on your TV, plug your Apple, your, your, your Apple TV or get your iPad Pro and, uh, 
and uh, and you can continue to be creative over and over across multiple segment, multiple projects. That is, there is no more limit to that. And 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 even think about now where production, you know, for the first half of uh, the last half of 2020 and the first half of first part of 2021 moved outside the United States because you could actually shoot outside the United States. The so, restrictions so, for for that was so. here were were advantaged, but you know, New Zealand and Australia are open, so a whole lot of production moved that way, and we it go. didn't change your business. You just had to have more. You just had I more just, work. <laughs> I, we worked in Australia right now. We have three shows going, and uh, what we do is uh, we just did. Uh, yeah, no problem. That's I had a production that uh, quarantined and moved to Australia, didn't find Australia to be working for them, picked up, moved to Budapest, moved to the next place. They were moving from place to place to try to get up and running uh, during the pandemic. And for us, I think that's where the global reach and power of Technicolor was in service of the content, right? Which is yeah. we were able to mobilize that action and we didn't find it uh, concerning or as a hold back to, in order to service the artistry that needed to happen. We were just there, right? Yeah, yes and. So let's talk about your roadmap and how you're moving forward and some of the tools that you did with this. Um, I, I know what they're called, but I'll let you introduce them because um, this is a lot of people don't realize that this is kind of the launch of Technicolor's new new branding aspect as they have moved away from more conventional color systems and moved into the digital world. Um, a lot of things are going on here. Why don't you talk to us about your new technology platform? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Brady has been at the forefront of, uh, of uh, you know, in the middle of, uh, not in the middle, earlier on dur during the pandemic, we, we're in a business where we're doing dailies, we're servicing avids, we do the color, the finishing, uh, the, uh, the, the, the online and uh, sound mixing, editorial, and then, uh, and, and then, uh, and also, you know, the marketing material. And we did, uh, uh, Brady, you should, cover, I'm sure, the Quibi launch as well. So for each steps of the way, my team will reach out to me as like, hey, we got to find solution. We got to find solution. We're going to find enough. We, we, we need to have a coordinated approach about what's going on in the world and how every step of the way we should have a remote solution. And we did that. And Mary, I will, yeah. It to you to, to carry on. Yeah, on. so I think, uh, Gary, as you mentioned, we're going through a moment of transformation. So technical art post-production as a whole, uh, many have read in the trades, has been sold to Streamline Media. So Streamline Media, which owns Picture Shop and Formosa Sound, uh, Finale in Vancouver, The Farm. Uh, and so we will be joining forces. What does that mean for us? Well, part of our software technology uh, team is part of that acquisition. Uh, and so we will be carrying our production-related tools uh, like Pulse and Text stream, uh, which are the two main solutions that we really felt to be a value add to uh, content creators during during the pandemic. Uh, so what are those two tools? So Pulse is our moment of capture tool. So essentially, it is taking all of your original camera media, it is loading them directly into either on prem storage that can be extended remotely or directly up into the Microsoft Azure cloud. Uh, it is then able to do um, automated transcode and delivery of visual effects polls, conform polls. Really, some of the first questions and phone calls I got was, what do I do? All my content is on an LTO tape and you don't have a brick and mortar. So what should I do next? Uh, and so our clients that were already utilizing polls saw the benefit of that, which is they were able to log into our web interface, see all of their original camera media, transfer it out to any of the vendors that needed it. They were able to load EDLs and CSVs and be able to do those plates, polls, transcode and deliver to whichever various vendors on the visual effects side they were working with or whichever DI facilities they were working with, even if it was not Technicolors. Um, and so that process is step one of what we believe is our virtual platform. Uh, and so our approach to that uh, process is to be able to layer solutions that are artist agnostic, uh, that sit inside a single sign-on infrastructure that can support the process of production all the way through post-production. And so we're starting with original camera media. We are in the process of um, incorporating a viewer into that, um, that original camera media uh, asset manager, uh, which will allow you to have review and approve tools. Uh, and then from there, we move to TechStream, which will be rebranded under the acquisition, uh, but we are in the process of working through that rebranding. What that is for us is it's a live collaboration tool. It's what allows us to put the session with our artists directly in the palm of the hands of the content creators, whether they need to be in facility or at home or both. Uh, and so for us, it's been invaluable and our relationship with Teardeck has been essential to that as well. Uh, and I think for, for us, we're excited to be able to take it from original camera media directly into the cloud and start connecting 
collecting the pieces of the pie as we move down the supply chain in a way that feels uh, as a, a tailwind uh, to content creation, you know, for artists by artists, always with the artist in mind. Uh, when we look at our dailies process, incorporating color into that processing of those files and understanding that a move to the cloud doesn't mean a separation from the artistic process. We have to always be incorporating the artistic process into everything we're doing and ensuring that the value of that artistic process is felt in the technology solutions we release to market. Well, and, and I don't think everyone may not think about this the same way that we do, but when you say camera media, I mean, in your world, that's a hundred different types of, of ingest formats. I mean, it's, it's, you know, three, 13 different flavors of raw. It's, it's mm -hmm. e EXR files for, for output. It's, you know, acquisition of airy raw or frame-based media. There's a lot of different things that go into that. So, so that for that discussion, for people to think about that, just to have an understanding that they may be getting from a single project camera from eight or uh, media from eight or nine different types of cameras that all has to be synced and maintained and, and the data kept or whether it's reds or DXLs, whether it's a, you know, whether it's airy raw or ProRes, you know, whether it's film versus, uh, you know, digital negative, you don't know. And, you, and you're never going to actually worry about that until it actually starts coming in. And then, but that process of maintaining all those various types of data, that's why the viewer is so, so complicated and people don't have that little, they, they go, well, it's just a viewer. It's not a big deal, but it's like, if you don't understand if you're trying to handle it's media huge. that, that doesn't have LUTs, that doesn't have color, that doesn't, that's that has. That's the thing, we're for artists by artists. <laughs> I don't have the luxury of saying, don't look at this for color. As Massimo <laughs> has often said during this pandemic, color, it's in the name. So we don't have the luxury of going like, this is not a color accurate tool. We have to say it is, right? So for us, it's a different level of responsibility. And you're exactly right that uh, there are many different flavors of OCF or original camera files or original yeah. camera media. In addition to that, when we talk about automated transcode, every single visual effects vendor gets a different flavor of output. And all of those things have to map in color and color pipeline. And that's yeah. the promise that when you come to someone like like us that you you expect and I think to your point Gary a lot of times people think like well of course and you're like yes it, it should be yes of course it absolutely should be and that's the tool that we have been able to supply to the market but to get there it's a complicated issue right it's a very complex issue to be able to ensure that the quality expectation you make when you come to a team that also houses a bench full of artists uh can hold up to that proposition right and obviously, yeah, and not obviously, actually, we, we see ourselves as the source of, of truth, right? We, we want to be that gatekeeper. And that's why, from our perspective, the way we see, you know, our roadmap in terms of, uh, in terms of technology is we are in the business, we have our clients and, our, and, and the production. We're in the business where we're going to host what's the most critical part. It's going to be their OCF. There are not many players, you know, around the world. You can bring a bunch of tools to that, but we have the obligation and, 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 and the vision that the quality of the OCF needs to be somewhere, either if it's in the cloud or it's in the, on our private uh, data center. And essentially what we do now, because we are in that daily business, we're going to keep bringing more and more tools to, to that content. Mm -hmm. And really what happened over the last, you know, over the last, you know, 20 years um, is the content has going, you know, has been moving around, essentially. Our vision of technology is we're going to take the content once, the OCF, we're going to move it once, either in the cloud or your private cloud or your, or, or, or your, or your data centers, and we're going to bring tools to it. And the tools that are either from the pre-production, post-production, you know, sound color, call it, mm -hmm. uh, we want to bring more and more tools. Either it's about collaboration, creativity, visual effects, obviously, and and this is where essentially on a linear, uh, if you look at it, I mean, in terms of just lines, in terms of value creation, we want to bring those tools as they go, and really making those tools very easy. It doesn't have to be the technical tools all the time. I think we're looking, you know, trying to be smart about the tools that our clients love. Shotgun, yes, we have an integration of Shotgun now in our uh, in, in, in our Pulse platform, because that's, you know, that, that we understood as well, and we are listening to our clients and make sure that they, you know, or Avid's, we're looking obviously at Avid's as, as one of the, you know, one of the critical 
uh, aspects of, of bringing tools to uh, to our ecosystem. So, and, and we've we've talked about it a bunch, but but you know, for the listeners, they need to understand that that you can't have any limitations on your end. There's nothing you you, you can't say no. We don't do that. <laughs> it, no, it, and it I think that's exist. the reason. That's I think the one of the reasons that we're so focused on building a common data set when we look at how we operate. We are not expecting to be all things to all people. What we believe is because we are at that moment of capture alongside companies like Teradek, how do we utilize the information being captured on set and then connect it to additional solutions across the across the supply chain? Those are not all mm -hmm. going to be Technicolor solutions. No. The industry knows and loves all of their software solutions that are out there, but that common data set and the metadata associated with all of that information is what carries us through. What's the gain for that? Well, it should simplify the process. It should also cut down on the churn of moving data to and from a certain location. And lastly, it should provide us analytics. It should provide us information back of where and how much and how was it used and where was it duplicated mm -hmm. and where was it stored. Uh, and so for us, we're really focused on that. And one of the ways that, that we, we feel really passionate about our relationship with, with Microsoft on that topic is, is that I saw in one of the questions, we are not competing with our content creators. We absolutely want to be in service of content creation. And so we are not in the same business as an Amazon who is providing cloud services and also creating content. Uh, we are partnered with teams that are more agnostic. They're, they're really about supporting the artistry of the community forward. But it's true. You know, you were asking us a minute ago, you can't say no. You're absolutely right. Uh, on a regular basis, you know, actually recently, uh, because we're capturing so much data on sets, I was being asked, hey, could you capture, you know, anything that has to do with script, notes, et cetera, et cetera. Can we have that in Pulse? I mean, my first answer is like, yeah, I mean, that, that doesn't seem, you well, know, I think we can always API, but uh, it's, it's after that, we, we're trying to like find priorities, you know, uh, we, we, and, and, and where, where, where we think that fits with, with also. Uh, well, the, the and that's a fundamental change in the industry, particularly right. from, from, from the technicolor view, because film didn't have metadata. It was, the, you know, it was a camera list, you know, so let me wrote it down on a piece of paper and maybe or maybe not that piece of paper survived the lab and, and those kind of things. And now, particularly because of the focus on metadata, we now have an end to end chain where we're controlling all of that data in a way we never could before and are able to deliver content based on that. I mean, because you're doing visual effects and things, things like lens metadata all of a sudden becomes apparent and becomes something you can handle. Um, you know, positional metadata for, for you know, virtual projects or non virtual projects or, or visual effects. I mean, there's a whole bunch of going on in this revolutionary stage we're in right now where we're trying to marry game engine technologies to what's going on in real production versus green screen and everything else. And that metadata is more than key in all of this. And it's not been something that's been kept or maintained a lot until very, very recently. And, and that brings up a real interesting point when you start talking about being able to, do, to dynamically load scripts for script sync from Avid for episodic television, but you're also loading you know, lens data, camera position data on a crane for the visual effects. This data pipeline is as, is as important as the visual image and the sound pipelines, and we don't talk about it enough. Yeah. Well, and when we, we map out our dailies process, we map them out by shoot and scene and take except for that we don't relate that back to the script itself, right? So the script itself is on set and there's camera notes that are associated with it. And there's script notes that are associated with it, but all that information, again, when we get to the OCF is lost, right? So mm -hmm. it's about that connective tissue. And, and again, back to the common data set, which is where does the common data start? Well, it starts at scene and take, or it starts at script phase. How do we continue to carry that through all of the other things that touch it? And how do we associate packs of data together, which is this is always this is always that meaning mm -hmm. this is always scene 13 these are the things that are all scene 13 uh and and there is no there's no switch for that today right we think of it as like oh well i can search it you know i think when pics hit the market and we were able to actually go and look at scene 13 directly right into the infrastructure <laughs> it was like hey you can like google scene 32a and you can see it you know uh but again that's this continuation that we're on right is to say we want to get all the way to the end film and be able to point back at every piece of data associated with the scene in this moment wow so i, I, I we close out because we're starting to run out of time uh, um what do you think is going on and, and are you excited to bring the solution to market and, and what do you see for Technicolor in the space and, and for their association with Teradek? So. 
So, so the way we Massimo, see Massimo, you first. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Brady. Uh, I think the way, the way uh, we see it, actually, uh, especially with Teradek, is the collaboration layer. I, I really do think that uh, the technology is there, but I think there's still, uh, still a few aspects where I feel that uh, we can still improve, especially around, around collaboration, where we create a whole ecosystem where actually uh, once we cover some of the security uh, issues we, we, we may have, uh, because, you know, to, to combine creative, I mean, creative process and collaboration in a secure way, that, that's where I think we're still, we still have a few things we got to fine tune, but uh, it, it's moving along, it's moving along nicely. So I think where, where we're going collectively is we're going to add more tools and we need to add more collaboration. And not only because we think that no one is going to go back to post houses or, or, or mixed stage or whatsoever, simply because people like you know people like like, like to, to we want them to be creative and actually to be creative on steroids. So if we give them the tools where yeah maybe twenty percent of your time you are going to go to a post facility, but the rest of the time you can be virtually in a room with uh, a visual effects. Uh, supervisor where we can actually combine right in front of your eyes, you know, a green screen with whatever, you know, whatever render or et cetera, et cetera. And that can happen right there in front of you and on a collaboration tool. That is the vision where, uh, I mean, I have always this vision where you're going to have essentially, uh, imagine someone who is a creative, uh, either it's a DP or whatsoever, and he's in a room, he's in a cube where he has essentially three screen left and center and on the right. And it has everything coming from editorial on one side, the color happening in front of him, the visual effects as well dropping on the on on on, uh, on the right hand side. You can imagine being in a cube where where essentially you can move virtually uh, ju just the creative process. And that is where again, this is kind of my my twenty thirty vision. This is where I see post production, but also production in general going. So that that that's where that's that's the idea. Brady, you get to close out on that. Wow. Oh, thanks. Uh, I think what Teradek brings to the partnership, uh, I think, is essential to where we're going, which is that it provides us the ability to be nimble. Uh, we absolutely rely on the technology infrastructure that Teradek provides to us in order to act quickly uh, and be able to collaborate with filmmakers to, to make changes and to add to our process and to build more glass-to-glass -glass solutions. And so for us, what comes next? Continued development of TechStream uh, and being able to really push 4K and HDR into the marketplace, 5.1 and Atmos Sound coming shortly mm -hmm. thereafter. Uh, when we talk about onset monitoring all the way through the process, I'm capturing OCF, but I need to connect it back. I got to be able to connect directly from what's happening on set. And we know that that live collaboration tool that Teradex is able to provide us is the way that we can do that. We can associate what people are seeing on set to the OCF and then associate the files that they're reviewing with their artists on the back end back to that OCF. And so to us, it's about that ability to continue to collaborate. And I think we've been really benefited, as Massimo said, by the partnership we've received from Teradex during the shutdown. I think for us, it's been great to be able to rely on this team to be able to uh, take feedback and provide us solutions and also get us up and running. I think when we talk yeah. about TechStream as an example, the mark of a great software solution is one we use internally exponentially. The only way that I'm getting picture and sound sync back to my, my artists at home is through TechStream. And that's utilizing the technology that Teradek is providing us. Wow, that's just amazing. And, and, and it shows the kind of technology that we have at our disposal when we, we work together. Uh, Brady, Massimo, I'd like to thank you for all of this. I wanna thank everyone else for coming. Um, I actually have another session, but if you guys wanna stay and um, uh, answer questions, I don't think, I don't know if there are any. I, I think we covered them all. Are there any questions left from anyone while we're still here? Happy to. I see 45 people in the room. So it's I, 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 there's a few people here. I, we didn't get that many questions. I hope they found something interesting in all of this. I loved how you took the question about Amazon and Netflix too. Thank you. So I yeah. didn't have to ask that one. So, but, but I really thank you for coming. And, and the session tomorrow, just so everybody knows, we're going to do it at 2 p.m. Pacific, is with Greg Cascio. And we're going to talk about the front end of this project and how he started working with you from a camera perspective. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's going to be an interesting one to talk on too, because it's the first half of this project. We actually started with the post side first, but that's actually the acquisition side of this project and how you get a full explanation of how all this works and we support um, greg uh you know greg we're on a project in the middle of summer last year and that was one of the first show uh almost
post, I would say, in the middle of the pandemic, but we we, we helped as well. So, yeah. uh, you know, always love to collaborate with Greg. Well, so. we don't have any more questions, and I thank both of you so much for all of this. Please rate it for uh, the session viewers. Please give us a rate on the end of it, and we thank you. Um, We've got more sessions today. We've got more sessions tomorrow too. Um, this is the first remote production conference and we're happy that you're here. Thank everyone for coming.